I'll be talking to Gary Weber in a bit, the author of the Fly Fisher's Guide to Oregon. This is the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. Hey, how's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I talk with Gary Weber, a professional photographer and the man behind the Fly Fisher's Guide to Oregon. We hear how the guide came uh, to be and how Gary wrote the guide via Wilderness Adventures Press, uh, Gary's work in Northwest Fly Fishing Magazine, and his favorite Oregon River. Don't miss this one as Gary, uh, we hear about how Gary's background covering the Space Shuttle Challenger and the World Series influenced his life. So, without further ado, here's Gary Weber from Wilderness Adventures Press. How's it going, Gary? It's going fantastic. How are you today, Dave? Good. Good. Yeah. Thanks for coming on here. We're going to chat a little bit about um, a book that you have out there, uh, Fly Fisher's uh, Fly Fisher's Guide to Oregon, which is, uh, you know, I think most of the people that listen to this, um, at least uh, old listeners know that uh, I'm in Oregon as well. And I connected with uh, Chuck, who's the publisher uh, out there at the uh, in Denver. And uh, yeah, well, actually, it's in Montana. He's he's in Montana. Oh, he's, he's in Montana. Belgrade, yeah. Montana. That's right. Yeah. yeah, he's in Montana. Well, we we ran into. Um, I was at the uh, Denver IFTD show, and he was there, right. And uh, we chatted about. It. I didn't realize. That, I mean, I think I'd seen some of the guides. He's got guides all around the country, but I didn't realize the extent. And you know, obviously, the Oregon guide. Uh, he he actually uh, gave me a copy. I've been uh, uh, thumbing through it. So we're gonna jump into that. But maybe oh, before great. we get there, can you just talk about how you first uh, got into fly fishing? Oh, sure. Okay. Well, it's kind, of, it's kind of a long story. I'll try to make it as brief as I can. I, I moved to Oregon 25 years ago to learn to fly fish, essentially. Um, well, I post, plus I had a great job here, too. <laughs> but the main reason I moved here is I wanted to learn how to fly fish. I grew up in Wisconsin, and I've fished my whole life since I was a child. But I never had the chance to fly fish. I always, you know, you bait fished or lure fished. And Wisconsin, it really is not a fly fishing mecca, as I'm sure you're aware, but I mean, it's, you know, it's getting better now. But uh, I was sort of Oregon, and I, I just had this, you know, fascination with wanting to learn how to fly fish. So I moved out here, and I went to the fly fishing shop in Welch's. I took a fly fishing class, and, or a fly fishing, a fly tying class, excuse me, and bought all my gear, and I started fishing. So I kind of credit them as getting me started in this, because I learned how to tie flies through them, and I bought my gear and they gave me a lot of tips and um, know-how, you know, to go out and do things. And, um, and ever since then, I've been just going out and uh, just exploring as many places as I can. I, you know, um, it's funny now that I'm working for Northwest Fly Fishing Magazine, and I'm covering all these new locations, and I kind of miss going to all the places that I used to go to, you know, 10, 15 years ago, because, you know, they've already covered those stories. Oh, and right. so I. Yeah, I'm hoping that this year I can revisit some of the places that I haven't gone to for a really, really long time. Gotcha. Okay, so you're, yeah, you're you're at the Northwest Fly Fishing, and so that so you write those articles. Is that kind of um, I guess that's a, a little bit of a side business you have going there. Is that something where I guess that's the question? You have these things. Do you still go to places where maybe you're not writing an article on it, but you just go there for for you know to fish? You know, I'm so busy now I can't. Oh, really? <laughs> and, and why are you? Yeah, I'm getting so many stories. Yes, I am. Yeah, oh, yep. you're, you're just a new busy. photographer. Oh, okay, yeah. Oh, that's Fun right. Place. So, yeah, maybe explain. You, you, most people think maybe when you retire, you're not that busy, but it sounds like you still have some stuff going. Well, a lot going on. Yeah, with the writing now and the well, the outdoor writing and photography. Um, yeah, so it keeps me very busy. I'm doing a second book, in fact, for Wilderness Adventures Press as we speak. Oh, really? Well, so, what's uh, that one on? And that was going to be the Fly Fisher's Guide to Oregon's Mountain Lakes. Oh wow! So it's going to be specifically on Mount, you know, the lakes in the mountains, the high mountain lakes, like in the Cascades. And what I've done is I've broken it down by wilderness area. So like the the, the fly fisher's guide was organized by the zones of you know the fly fishing or the fishing zones, the ODFW, you know, mm-hmm. uh, had determined. And this book, what I'm going to do is use wilderness areas because it seems like the majority of the lakes are focused or concentrated in those areas. Oh, cool, cool. No, that's a, that's it's going to be like. 190, or it's like 180 somewhere. I, I haven't determined an exact number yet, but it's going to be a pretty, pretty full book. And uh, 
chock full of information. <laughs> yeah. and I'm working on it right now, and it's it's pretty daunting, you know, looking at all these lakes. And I'm not going to be able to go to all of them, obviously. But oh. I'm going to as many of them as I can. Yeah. And I'm, you know, researching and talking to people to get other information. Oh, gotcha. Too. How do you so, find your, I noticed in your, your current book, the, uh, um, you know, Fly Fisher's Guide to Oregon, you've got the little snippets yes. at the start, kind of the intro, and some of them, are like, you know, for example, on the North Fork Nehalem, I think you talked about the handicap fishing, and all of them have a little snippet about something unique. How do you decide what to, what to put in, you know, the content as far as those little intros, and then just okay. overall? Well, I, what I look for is like a thread. I want to find something that I can like use throughout the entire story, like start the story with that and then wrap it up at the end with that same thread, if that makes sense. How did you do? And what I'm, I didn't actually uh, <laughs> read the whole entire, uh, you know, the entire. You didn't. Uh, no, I didn't read the entire book yet. But uh, <laughs> so the North Fork to Halem, how did you, if you started with the handy, how did you end? Or can you describe, maybe give us somebody that hasn't you know, read Well, I, I don't know if that's a good example. But, okay, you know, maybe give, um, us a good, give us a good example. Okay, let me think. Uh, All right, let's, 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 put you on right, Man Lake. Yeah, Man the Lake. The Man Lake story. Okay, um, and in fact, Man Lake, if you, you said you wanted to talk about that, and I would love to because that is the first place I ever caught a trout on a fly in Oregon. Lahontan Cutthroat? Oh, Lahontan Cutthroat. It was a 16-inch Lahontan Cutthroat at Man Lake, and that was the very first... When I very first moved here, I got a job at Oregon. Well, actually, I worked for the Trailblazers first, but then I got a job at Oregon State University as a photographer, and everybody I met there, the first question I asked them is, was I just had just started fly fishing. I said, where, where is the best place? What is the best destination to go to in Oregon to fly fish? And like almost unanimously, everybody said Man Lake. That's crazy. I, but wouldn't, this was, I wouldn't have thought that. But okay, but bear in mind, bear in mind, this was like 25 years ago. Okay, so, you know, the, the lake has changed dramatically in that time. We can talk about that. Yeah. Well, even it's that, I mean, a lot. Even, even 25 years ago, Man Lake doesn't, if I had to pick one spot in order, I mean, Man Lake, it's a little windy over there, you know. I know it is nice, but. Oh, yeah, it's extremely remote. Yeah, it, it, yeah, it, but that's why I love it. Yeah. You know, that, and that's what attracted me to it, you know, also. And the the, the landscape, is for, for a photographer, it's oh, mind-blowing. Right. I mean, it's, just, it's amazing. You know, so it's just great pictures, but. Yeah, so everybody said to go there, but like I say, this was a long time ago, and back then, they've changed the regulations, and they've changed things now, where I guess, like in an 8-inch fish, I don't keep my fish, I release them, but if the people that do, you, it used to be you had to catch a 16-inch fish in order to keep it at Man Lake, and now it's down to 8. Oh, wow. So they've changed. Yeah, and like, I don't know if you are aware of the, the goldfish infestation yep. and the poisoning. Oh, yeah. right. Right, so Lake has gone through a lot, but... Back in the day, you know, 20 years ago, you could catch 20-inch fish, you know, very easily, and lots of them. And it, you know, I'm not exaggerating, but now if you get, like, one fish, one really nice fish there, you should be happy. So so this is one like of those salmon. old stories, like you always talk to your grandpa, he said, back in the day, you know, you could walk across the backs <laughs> of the salmon. This is, this is, this is the real, real deal. This is, it, 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 yeah, it is, it is. And if you've ever been there, there's, like, an outlet creek, it's yeah, very yeah. small, and I don't know. Yeah. Okay, uh, I know which end that is on the south end, oh, whatever. But yeah. in the back, again, a long time ago, fish used to try to spawn, and they would run. You know, there's no natural reproduction there; they stocked it. But fish would try to spawn and run up that creek, and there would just be piles of dead fish. Oh wow! I've got photos to show it. Yeah, of them. So that lake used to just be chock full of fish. Yeah. But the level is dropping. I guess there's no water right to it. The ODFW has no water right, and there's a ranch or something that uses it for irrigation maybe or something and the level is dropping dramatically plus with the drought conditions that doesn't help you know yeah, so from yeah. what i understand it's a puddle now oh wow how do you uh, this is kind of on a different topic but, you know man sure. lake some of these and i'm not sure about all the the areas you cover but how do you avoid that thing you know i'm sure people have probably called you out saying hey you know why are you sharing these 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 rivers and lakes that nobody you know what i mean like putting you know oh, okay. so you write an article and then you got 50 thing. people yeah See, that's never happened. Huh. <laughs> yeah, believe it. Well, and, and I, you know, maybe they've contacted the magazine and said that, but nobody's ever contacted me directly. In fact, it's been the opposite. People have been, like, appreciative yep. of the fact that we're going out and doing these places. So That's cool. No, I haven't run into that. And the other thing, too, the, mag <clears throat> excuse me, the magazine is very careful about what they cover. They don't want to step on any toes. They don't want to, you oh, know. Okay. Well, like for a, example. Like an area that. 
I was going to say, okay. for example, like say the the river we were going to talk about today, uh, or maybe get into a little okay. bit, uh, is that st- the, the D and you know that starts with the it has a D and a D in it. Is that one that you've covered? And is it okay to say on here that we're not going to be you know bringing out too many secrets and people are going to get angry? Oh no 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 yeah we no we certainly can talk about it. But I'll tell you, the magazine is reluctant to cover that that venue because they're afraid that it might get so don't they know, don't so they don't cover it. that one. Well, they have it. I proposed this story to the editor there, and he said he would like to think about it because, like I say, it's a kind of a sensitive area. Okay, and, so this um, is the one, and that the was the one we, that was the one we talked about, well, maybe talking about today. Yeah, I, 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 if you, I'll name the place if that's all right. Well, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to name it if it's going to be something where you know we we don't want to necessarily throw a bunch of because there could be this podcast is you know you know could could send some people you know out there okay but uh, again i mean all these places are public yeah you know in my yeah and so i don't feel that that's a problem Good. okay and well, i think the magazine is, maybe they had covered it recently too and you know i don't think it's like they want to keep it top secret or anything like that i think they're just being careful about you know be respectful okay respectful of the good. area you know good well i'll let you uh, i'll let you name it then and we can just uh if you feel comfortable with that that's great Oh, sure. Yeah. And I'd love to name it because this is a very special place to be at the Donner and Blitzen River. And yep. most people refer to it as the Blitzen River. And most people probably aren't even aware of it. I mean, you know, it's it's extremely remote, like Man Lake. And, um, yeah. you know, I don't know if people want to take the time to go out there. Well, you, know, you know, the people that live there are very sparsely populated. So I think most of the people that go there don't live there. No, it is a long drive. Southeast you know? Oregon. It's the and it kind of the, the German writes the Dunder und Blitzen, is which is kind of a like th- lightning and thunder or something like that. Is that the? It means thunder and lightning, thunder right? It means lightning, thunder and lightning. Uh, yeah. No, it's cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's dig into that in a little bit. Um, I just had a couple other items I wanted to check in with you before we get there. Sure. And maybe you could just take you know for the fly fisher's guide, and maybe you can talk about your guide um, or or in general about the, the guides that Chuck has out there, but. Um, can you describe what, what your guide's like for somebody that's never picked it up and read it? Okay, well, my guide, and I, I would assume most of them are the same. I mean, he's, he's, he has one for all 50 states. I mean, some states are combined, like there's like Iowa and Wisconsin, like combined. But, yeah. And the whole the purpose of the guide is for somebody to pick it up and be able to go to a destination, know exactly what they will expect, what they need, you know, what, what species are there, what tactics they should use, the gear they should use, accommodations, you know, the campings, the facilities, all of those things. So ideally, this is like a, something where somebody can just pick this thing up, and if they want to go someplace, they should just, you know, they have, all the information is at their fingertips. That's cool. So somebody that was coming So somebody was coming from, you know, I've got listeners all around the country and, you know, all over the place. Sure. So if somebody wanted to come to, say, you know, they were fired up to do some summer steelhead fishing and they wanted to come over to the, the Deschutes River, you know, and they picked right. up your book and they flipped to the Deschutes page. What, what would they see there? Well, they would find that, you know, the seasons of, you know, the times to go there, the run times, uh, flies, um, the, uh, there's a very highly detailed maps of every location with GPS points. So, you know, I, and I'm not, you know, savvy about all that kind of thing. I just use a paper map because yeah. <laughs> I'm old school. Sure. But uh, a lot of people now, you know, have, you know, navigational devices and things like that. And this book. Um, oh, so the GPS, so they can actually literally like plug the GPS points into their unit. Exactly. Right. They can go to the map and if they want to go to X boat landing, it has a GPS coordinates in there. They just plug it in. Boom. It'll take them right there. Hmm. It gives them the trailheads of, um, you know, if there's a, a trail you have to hike, it gives a GPS for the trailhead. Does it give, like that. does it give. You know that the, the challenge with steelhead fishing is is kind of sometimes I guess knowing where to well I mean, I mean you can follow you know look at the parking areas and stuff but does it help people find out where the good runs are? Well, it doesn't disclose specific spots, but it gives areas that you can you know that that, that are concentrated with fish. If you mean that, I don't yeah. like you know disclose certain holes or anything like that. Although they're mentioned, we name the holes you know in certain. Like on the North Umpqua, you know, there's a whole bunch of named holes, and we talk yeah. about that, but the history more. Gotcha. But yeah, so no, there's no, it's, I, it, you know, and I don't think any book gives you a specific, you know, spot to go to. So this one's no different that way. But this one has more information, I think, in terms of everything that goes around it. You know, okay, okay, it's cool. Everything you need to know to, you know, before you get there, and then once you get there, you know, then then you kind of, you know, you explore. And I think that's part of the, you know, the joy of doing this. Yeah. You know? 
No, that's awesome. That's that's really cool. So yeah, basically, and and with the Northwest fly fishing, somebody could read an article, say in Oregon, on some topic you wrote about in that magazine. They can pick up your book and go a little deeper. Or, or does the Northwest fly fishing does that really cover all the nuts and bolts, kind of like your book? Yeah, it, 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 they're like a tandem thing, really. Yeah. You know, so it's like writing for one. Writing for one is like similar to writing for the other. I mean, they expect the exact same type of information, you know, which is very thorough. Yeah, and um. You know, they want something that's been field tested the place. Yeah, yeah basically, no, you know, that's perfect. So. That's perfect. Yeah. Well, and I yeah. wanted to know, you mentioned the Mark, well, you mentioned the Welches. I guess that was Bachman who helped you out there and, um, and, You're right. and John Shuey. I've interviewed both of those guys in past episodes and really, uh, oh, okay. really fun episodes. John Shuey was way, I can't remember the na- the number, but it was way back a couple years ago. And he, you know, it, it was great to talk to him. And then, and then Bachman actually, we went out on the river and did a little, uh, a little guide trip. And we, I, I did some, uh, oh, you know, on the Sandy? Other, yeah, on the Sandy. Yeah. So you can, you can hear yeah. you, if somebody wanted to listen to that, those two people, um, obviously people have been in fly fishing for a long time. Um, so yeah, no, that's good. I, this is cool. We're getting a take on this book and I think I, I want to provide people that are listening, you know, why this resource is you know, is important because I think that's, you know, where do you go fishing next? Right. Is that, that's kind of the question for some. Yeah. I can- well, again, and for you know, like for me, if, I, if something like this was available when I first moved here, this would have, I would have really appreciated it because, like, let's say for example, you want to target a certain species. Like, let's say you know, for me, like that, I love the red band trout of Oregon. There's like the seven distinct species of red band trout, and it only can be found here. Mm-hmm. And let's say for example, you would like to target one of those. This book, there's a chapter right on red band trout, but that's probably because I love that. Yeah. But beyond that, you know, there um, if if there's a certain like um, environment you want to go to, like let's say you like love the high desert, you know you can find a place that's in the high desert in the book, and you know and just focus on that. Or if you like the mountains, or if you like the coast, yeah. yeah and there, there wasn't something like that available really when I first no. Well, started, there, the one you know, thing that there was, well, maybe it wasn't available, but the uh, fishing Oregon, right, or fishing in Oregon. Yeah, that book, yeah, and that's a that's a great book, and it it, it lists everything. How but is there's really how is fishing not in a Oregon, lot of detail? How is fishing in Oregon different from uh, the your book here? Okay, and that okay, that book covers like everything. They want to cover every just well, almost every. I mean, it's impossible to get everyone, but they want to cover almost every destination. But they give you like a paragraph or two. You know, on the primary destinations, they give you a lot more, and they give you a map and things like that, but. For most of them, it's just a couple of paragraphs, and you know, and that probably is sufficient for most people. But like I say, if somebody wants more detail, that's this book here is the one you should gotcha. look for. That and also, you you focus on fly fishing, so I think flight the other one is you're right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the other one also talks about gear fishing as well, and this is specifically on fly fishing. Okay, okay, perfect, and. Um, yeah, it sounds like you have a really uh, interesting background in uh, photography. We, we've talked a little bit about photography, obviously, with fishing and, you know, the fish pics and Instagram. Sure. I'm surprised. That's one thing I'm surprised. I guess you're old school, but uh, Instagram, you could you could have a pretty uh, solid Instagram with all your yeah. photography, I'm sure. Well, yeah, yeah, I could. But like, I, and this may sound crazy, but this, this electronic revolution kind of changed my life I, as a photographer. I used to work in film. Oh, right. You know, I worked in dark rooms and shot by, you know, I worked for newspapers, shot black and white film. Gotcha. And, we're, and so once the digital revolution came on, it kind of lost, I, you know, cost me a job, basically, because oh. newspapers started to fall. Yeah, so, and then that's not the reason why I'm against all this, but it's like, I don't yeah. know, I'm just not. I hear you. You're a pro. You see people on their phones. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, that, or, there's two things, if I may say. One, one is a camera. A phone is not a camera. No. I, I will go to my grave believing that a phone is not a camera, number one. Yep. Number two, people are constantly, it, it annoys me how they're on their phone night and day. I know. You know, and it's just, I, know. I was at a Blazer game, and this girl didn't watch the game. She was on her phone the entire game, and I was like, oh. to my sister, she's just insane. It was yeah. a great game. That's crazy. You know, so, I know. I think. Yeah, that's a go off topic there, but yeah. no, no, no. You can go off topic anytime you want. I mean, I think we we live in oh, a. Yeah. It seems like more than ever we live in a, this crazy world where it's almost like you look around, and you think sometimes, man, is this really the world we live in? And oh but, yeah, but, right, yeah. Especially with we're in the outdoor environment, you know. I think that's what that's the secret. I think really for these kids or anybody, right, mm-hmm. is is to get outdoors and connect. Well, with that's nature. what attracts me. That's what attracts me to fly fishing is the, it's, it's so basic, you know, and, it, it, and the tradition, you know, and all that. And that's, like, maybe that's why I, I'm against all these, you know, high tech things because, 
yeah, I, 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 I like just very rudimentary things. You know, yeah, yeah. very basic things, and that's what fly fishing is. It's you know, right down to the core. No, I hear you. I hear you. No, it is the photography. I, I, uh, you know, with the phone, it's a great point. I mean, that's that's what's great about an, a great old school SOR camera or whatever is it, it forces you to actually exactly. look through. You know, set up your photo. You know, and we've talked a little bit. I've had some actually really good uh, fishing photography kind of guests on, and they've talked about some tips on you know setting up photos, and and I'm sure mm-hmm. you know all about that, but. What is the um, so the Trailblazers? I mean, what's your what's your take on those guys? This is this is pretty good. I'd like to hear your history here on, on your connection there, and, and, and then why oh, okay. why are the why, why do the Trailblazers only have one championship? That's that's the big question. <laughs> well, if you watched them last night, you probably understand why. No, um, <laughs> my history. I like I say, I'm from Wisconsin. I work for the Milwaukee Bucks, and when I worked for them, they were pathetic. I mean, it's, it's crazy now oh, that they're did they win championship? Them to, in seventy one, oh, okay. yeah, they you know with you know Luel Cinder back then it was Kareem Abdul Jabbar and Oscar Roberts and the other big old no way they way, had, way they back had, they had Oscar and Kareem on the same team. Oh yeah, that's the team team that won the championship yeah, in seventy one. Said Oscar Robinson, he was yeah, he was like a the um, big old. He was kind of like a, a almost like a, a, a Michael Jordan kind of a guard, right? He a- averaged a triple double. I thought. I think his his average was a triple double. Yep. Just, you know, when he retired, Here, here's you can't a, believe that. So, here's yeah, a he, fun fact I would like somebody to, to fact check, but my dad played a little basketball. He was a, he went to University of Portland, and uh, okay. he, he was born in 39, and uh, okay. so, but that was the one year when University of Portland, back in those days when he was in college, they were a pretty good team. They went to the tournament. It was the first time they went to the tournament, and uh, and they wow. played. The NCAA? Yeah, NCAA. Yep. It was the yeah. first, first time ever, and uh, they played. Uh, a team from San Francisco, I believe, uh, in the first round, and Oscar Robinson was on that team. And, oh wow! And he okay. so he played against Oscar Robinson, and uh, this is kind of funny because you know my dad, I played hoops too, but my dad was like a whole another level, kind of a semi pro. But um, sure. but yeah, he said Oscar just it was it was like kids in a candy store. I mean, he was just I think he scored whatever he scored. You know, he probably scored fifty points or something, and. Easy, sure. easily but yeah so i always love that here these days because i i've got a connection to basketball that's my sport and the trailblazers i mean geez i mean god talk about a, a tough team to watch over the years yeah I, yeah well i'm not giving up on them this year but you know just to, if i can back up to answer your question yeah when i was working for the bucks i you know i lived in wisconsin and i hated winter i wanted to learn how to fly fish one but i also hated winter and i got i lived on a lake actually i had a house on a lake and one day I came home from a one night, I came home from a game and it was a snowstorm and my lock on my door had frozen of my house. So I had to punch my window out <laughs> of the door to, to, to get into the house. And I thought that's it. I'm leaving. I cannot <laughs> take this anymore. <laughs> and that's what you know prompted me to come here. But anyway, um, so I was working for them and I knew I could more or less get a job more or less anywhere I wanted in the United States as long as they had a basketball team. Because at the time I was doing really well and I knew I'd get a good reference from the Bucks. So I kind of traveled around. I went to North Carolina first. I was going to try to get a job with the Charlotte Hornets, but once I got to North Carolina, I hated it. Really? What I just didn't like. Yeah, too it was, hot. It was hot. It was humid. It was. It was just. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, it seemed dirty. I, yeah. I, I don't know. It just really, really bothered me. I didn't really like it. Even with the, now, what am I going to do? Even with the redfish, the redfish there, you still couldn't do it. Right. Yeah. And I don't want to. Yeah. And I thought there's no fly fishing here or, yeah. or anything like that. And I, then I thought of Portland. I, I thought, well, so I drove out, out here. And the minute I got here, I fell in love. I was driving to the Columbia River Gorge. I fell in love with this yeah. place. And I thought, I'm home. I knew I was home the minute That's I drove. Cool. So, I, so I moved here and then I went to the track, pro- approached the Trailblazers. They liked what I had and I, I worked for them. But I, the thing that's sad, I only worked for them for one year. And this is, again, goes back to this digital revolution thing because back then we were still shooting film. But they had a, a guy, I shot black and white, and they had another photographer that shot color. And they realized that they could just convert the color photos to black and white. The quality would be really bad, but oh, they wow. didn't care. They could save money. Hmm. And so that's how I lost that. I was eliminated from that job. There. No kidding. And this was also the year that they got rid of Bill Shonley. Oh. Uh, to, if you remember that. Damn. So this is like in the 95 or, yep. yeah, and like they cut a bunch of vendors. Why, did they, get, why did they get rid of Shonley? You know, I don't know. It was like a cost cutting thing because they, like I said, they got rid of him. They got rid of me. They got rid of some other people, and then they started getting rid of vendors. Yeah, it was crazy. I don't know. They're you know was, they give the so these how long huge ago was salaries. This? What year was this? This was like ninety ninety five. Oh yeah, 1990. 95. that was the one. Year, 
Yeah, 94-95 season. P.J. Carlissimo was the coach, if you can remember back then. And Rod yeah. Strickland was probably the... Oh, yeah. I remember that. Those were, those were rough days. Well, let's see, 95. So the year they should have won a championship was, I want to say it was, it was in 2000. that range. Oh, was it 2000? Yeah, it was like in 2000, That's 99, right. 2000. Yeah, 95 was yeah. not a great time. I think P.J. Carlissimo, that wasn't a, a great a period, I don't think. No, he didn't last very long. He didn't last very long. And they, yeah. And the, the team they had, that was the, the start of the Jailblazers. The Jailblazers. Uh, also. If you can remember that, yeah. Oh. I mean, that's when like Rasheed Wallace and, you know, the other people, and I, it was oh, yeah. actually before him, maybe. But I, yeah, they had um, just people that, uh, with, uh, yep. The, Zach Randolph. Oh, Zach, Zach. Randolph. That's, yeah, he's the main, uh, he was one of the main tra- jailblazer guys, I remember. Well, like you had Zach, game. and you had the other guy that uh, got caught uh, with a uh, pop can smoking. Damon dope. Stoudemire. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, it was his infamous airport, the, uh, yeah. the tinfoil the in tin the crotch foil. airport. Thing. God. Stoudemire. <laughs> yeah. Man. Okay. All right. Well, this is good. Yeah, no, we, so could go, we could be asked the tr- Well, uh, your background in photography is interesting because I think, I mean, that's basically how you support yourself most of your life. Yeah, I worked as a new. I worked for United Press International. That was the first job I ever had. I um, worked for the Houston Post. You know, it's funny. All the places that I have worked for no longer exist. Huh. <laughs> no it's crazy. In wires, uh, United Press, a wire service. You know, and that, they went. I would have been happy for the, my entire life if I could have worked for them for my entire life. But they went bankrupt. Oh wow! Like in 1984. No kidding. Believe it or not. Yeah. So you know, the, the, the Associated Press is the only wire service really oh. out there now. But yeah. So, so yeah, you, so you know, yeah, and you officially now feel like you're, you know, you're retired, but you're you're, you're still kind of doing some stuff on the side. I'm semi, yeah, you could say semi. I'm semi-retired. Yeah, yeah I th- there are no good jobs for photographers anymore. I mean, there, period. No kidding. So I just want to shoot what I want to shoot, and so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm I'm loving what I'm doing. Yeah, that's awesome. And, yeah, there are, yeah, and the Northwest fly fishing. Um, you know, that magazine. So I'm just thinking, you know, you have John Chu, who obviously has been out there a while. And I, I wasn't, uh, Chuck, to, can you talk a little bit about Chuck? Um, and what, what's Chuck's last name? Uh, Chuck Johnson. Yeah, I mean, Chuck, from the, the, the publisher. Yeah, yeah, Chuck yeah he's the publisher. He's from, can you tell us a little about, I mean, do you know Chuck pretty well? Or is this something where you're just kind of getting to know him? And, and how is Chuck maybe different from the whole publish the operation over with Shuey and the gang? Okay, well, to, to be honest with you, I don't really know him that well. Yeah. I mean, in the uh, uh, the meetings that we've had, or the you know the uh, the collaborations we've had, have gone great. And I, you know, I really um, like the fact that they just let me do. You know, I, they don't tell me what to write or what to. Say. I just, you know, they yeah. re- trust me. They rely on what I, you know, and so I just do what I do, and and they're happy with it. You know, and so yeah. it's a very easygoing relationship. Um, I want to say that the, John Shuey, I, I owe a lot to, I owe a debt of gratitude to, because he is the one that recommended me to write this book. Oh, cool. Um, I, I started working for the magazine on a whim. I just, I, I, I wanted to do a story about Man Lake, you know, so I, and I thought now is the time to do it. And this is like four years ago. And I, I sent, so I sent him an email and explained this. And he's like, well, we just did a story on that. How about doing East Lake? I'm like, great. So I did that instead. And that just took off. And I've been working for him for like four years ever since. And, no uh, kidding. Yeah, and I really, yeah, like I say, he he's extremely easy to work with, um, and so is Chuck. You know, both yeah. of the guys, and I think that's part of the reason why I like doing it. Yeah, gotcha. Okay, yeah, no, it's uh, I'll have to check out now that I know you're you're out there. I, I'll keep an eye out for some of your articles. What do you think is the one? Yeah. Do you have a favorite uh, Northwest fly fishing um, article or destination? You, I do. You wrote about, and I think I do, and I think they do too. And it's it's on the Lower Owyhee River. Yep. Um, and are you familiar with your, I'm sure you're familiar oh, with yeah. that destination. Yeah, right? I love the other yeah, Okay. And yeah. that, okay. And that is an extremely problematic destination. And so the story, it's not so much about fishing the place. It's about respectfully fishing the place. Because when we were first talked about doing it, we were talking about how crowded it is and how people have no manners. They use poor catch and, te- uh, catch and release techniques, you know, all these things like that. And I said, well, why don't we do a story that details that? Yep. That's exactly what we did. And the story's called The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly yep. about the river. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, if, if you've never been there and you want to go there, I highly recommend people fish there. I would recommend reading the story because it kind of details a lot of the negative points and, and the positive yep. points, too, but things that, you know, people should be more aware of. And I, 
And we got feedback on that story. Sure. Well, and it was, all po- it was all positive. It, people were like, thank you for writing this. That's you, cool. You, know, you brought this to, you know, to our attention because people, you know, they're, they just bury their heads in the sand about this, you know. And well, so, what's the big um, negative they, uh, when, about that you highlighted? Well, a lot of it's the catch and release techniques, you know, the way people handle fish. Uh, that was one. And also their etiquette. You know, um, like walking, uh, fishing like 10 feet away from somebody, walking to somebody's hole, or if you're waiting on, and I I detailed some stories. One story I had, I I was camping, and there's a great spot that I love, and like there's a camp spot right in front of it. So normally when you camp there, you're kind of guaranteed to have that spot because people won't walk through your campsite. Yeah. You know, they're, you know, they have some manners, I guess. Yep. Well, this van uh, with um, out-of-state plates pulled on this. I wrote this in the story, too. A van with out-of-state plates what, what pulled state? right up to my campsite. I, it was a rental oh. van, so I don't <laughs> know. I, but it was like, there were, you know, it wasn't an Oregon. It wasn't California. California. And, <laughs> and no, well, no, well, yeah, I would remember that. No, it wasn't that. But So there are like six guys get out of this van, and they're all speaking in a foreign language. What, and they what, proceed yeah. to like... I don't know. It's like French or something. I, I, yeah. I don't know. It was, it was really bizarre. And they get out of the van and I look at them and they just walk right. And I go, excuse me. And like, they're just going to walk. They start walking right through my camp, like just right past me. Wow. You know, to go to the Didn't spot. even, didn't even like, stop and say me. hi? No, they just kind of looked at me and I said, excuse me, I, I was going to fish them. And then they started babbling this foreign dialect, you know, and right. I, I couldn't understand them. And, I have a feeling that they were doing that on purpose. I think they understood that. And I was they, like, look, I was going to fish there in another hour. I'm just waiting, you know, if you waited, you know, just until they start rising, yeah. you'll do a lot better if you go, instead of going in there and splashing the water, you know, and, and ruining the hole. But yeah, no, they just, just walked right through. They, they sound like, uh, like, they sound like terrorists. <laughs> they were eco-terrorists. Yeah. yeah, basically. Yeah. Damn. And so they ruined the hole. So yeah. they went in there, put all the fish down. I, you know, I went out there like an hour after they had left, you know, they went, you know, Trashed the spot and then left, and I went back out. I got a fish, but it was like it was not the same. It could have been a lot better, you know. And so we're just talking like things like that. Just it's just simple etiquette. Yeah, you know, if you basic. if the guy would have said, "Excuse me, you know, are you would you mind if I go in here?" Or you know, if they would have just yep. you know communicated with you or something. But no, they just walked right through and just ruined the hole. And right, you know, yeah, that left. And there's incident if, again. If you read the story, there's incident after incident no <laughs> where things like this have happened. Yeah, and you know it's really sad because that's yep. such a beautiful place and the fishing is phenomenal. Yeah, you know, I, I, and I that's hear, what you have to bear in mind. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I wrote a blog post a, a couple of years ago, I think, on uh, etiquette. I can't remember exactly what it is, but it was. Uh, <laughs> it will get get back to my dad. What I've what I've learned from my dad, you know, growing sure. up. But when I when I was a kid, he. Uh, you know, I, I can't remember if I talked about this on the air, but I watched him get into a fist fight on the Deschutes River with another yeah. with another angler. Wow! And, and over it was what? And I was over, and I was only uh, I was like ten, you know. So here, short, long story short, this is up at uh, on the Deschutes up at Mecca, and I'll put a link in the show. Oh, notes. sure, Mecca. I'll, I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes to the article I wrote, but. Um, yeah, this was at Mecca and we were, we were down at the, you know, at the campground and we were driving up to about midway up the road, you know, going up river to fish. And we passed okay. this guy who was walking on the road who had just got out. He, he was like, he floated. I think they were floating from above just a short little float or something. And, and he asked some, I can't remember. He asked if we could have a ride or something. And my dad basically just said no, you know, oh, the, yeah. When we were at the campground, okay. when we were, we were near him at the boat ramp and he said, no, we couldn't give him a ride. So the guy who started walking, he was going to walk up the road up towards his, I guess, up towards uh, the, the top Warm Springs. And the guy just was cussing. Okay. We, we drove by and he was just cussing my dad out. And, uh, <laughs> and you know, it was crazy. It was just like, it, and my dad back in the day, he was, like I said, back at University of Portland, grew up in Portland those days, man. It was, he, he got in a lot of fights. So he was, okay. kind of, he was kind of old school, right? So he was, he, his buddies sure. were the black guys on the basketball team. So he knew all about that. Anyways. You know, he wasn't going to let this guy. So he parked the car by the hole and he said, he said, you wait here. And I said, and, I said, yeah. okay. and he walked up towards to this guy who was walking up the road and I saw him and I, and I didn't wait. I followed my dad behind. I saw him. He took out his false teeth. He took out, he took off, his, <laughs> he took off his wristwatch and he came up to the guy and he, he basically said, dude, you're way out of line and started basically poking him on the chest. And, <laughs> and, and, and the guy was like, you poke me one more time and I'm going to take you down. They just got into it brawl and it was like on the ground and. Oh man, it was just bizarre. Yeah, and I was like ten or whatever, and watching this whole thing, and uh, 
And then finally, my brothers came up. My brother was there, and uh, he drove up with his other buddy in, in another car. They were heading out, and uh, they didn't know what the hell that was going on. They thought this guy was ha- – they thought my dad was maybe having a heart attack. The, the guy was helping. You know, they didn't know. But yeah, my brother got yeah. out, realized they were fighting, and he pulled him up, and uh, and the guy yeah, was like – the guy was like, "You want a piece of me too?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> and uh, and Chris was uh, left-handed and young, and uh, and the guy took a swing at him and and missed. And my brother dropped him with a left hook on Jeez. the ground. Wow! Yeah. Okay. I was on the shoot. I've never had that. Never. No. Um, so luckily, this, this is old. This is like talk about old school. I mean, I think that my dad used to tell stories about the Deschutes, you know, they were out there, he fished the Deschutes back before, you know, with my grandpa. And they used to say, if they saw another person fishing, it was kind of, you know what I mean? They had the, a lot like of the a big deal. Yeah. Right. But they, that was the deal back then, you know, it was kind of fist fights and, and whatever. Right. Wow. It was a, so anyways, okay. I hear you bringing it back to where you're at because I fished the Oahe. I don't remember it being like that, but I guess it's gotten busier. When's the last time you were there? It's been a long time. It's probably been, I don't know, yeah, maybe 15 years. Who knows? I can't remember exactly. Okay, yeah. it's yeah. And the other thing, too, since it's so close to Idaho, they consider it their pet fishery, and that was another issue with it, too, and they don't want people to know about it. So they were kind of against oh, right. the publicity. Right, but that's purposely why we did it, too. It was like It's like it's a public place. You know, and if people would respect that and respect each other, then there'd be no problems. It would be fine. You know, so yep. yeah, so there's like a whole lot of issues tangled up in there, but I think it was a good thing to do and I think it was received well and I'm glad I did it. Yeah. You know, no, that's I, great. I, I haven't been back there and I want to go back there. Um, but the last time I was there, I had, you know, I, I found a great camp spot and I, I left for the morning one fishing and I came back and there were like a thousand trailers around me. It was no way, you know, and it was just, yeah, no, like I said in the magazine, I said, it's like it was going to an RV and travel trailer Palooza. I mean, it was just wow. like, I was just, surrounded but not, and i was like this is not fun God. you know i wanted to have some seclusion yeah, you know generators and, and that's stuff. how exactly and see that's how popular the place is getting and i don't you know i don't begrudge people for going there i you know we want people but it's yeah i don't know this should be more decorum i guess I, you know or something i guess yeah I what, what about a yeah no i hear you it's like or, or a you know, do do some of these places get to where they're starting to restrict you know well like the deschutes is right they restrict the number of boaters that can go down that river <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Right. I don't think that that's going to happen to this place or other, you know, walk-in fishery. With boats, that's different, but with like walk-in fisheries, I don't think that's an issue, you know, ideally, hopefully, but um, yeah. Yeah, who yeah. knows, you know, maybe down the road that might, you know. That yeah, might, might be, be a part of it. Well, let, let's let's jump into yeah. the, just real uh, quickly here on the Donner and Blitzen. So, um, you know, we mentioned that at the, at the start. It's, uh, I fished it and it's a, it's a cool little river out there in Southeast Oregon. It's kind of down in the canyon and you got all this stuff. Can you talk a little bit about how, you know, it sounds like you've got some experience, how you catch fish over there on that river? Oh, sure. Okay. The first thing I would recommend to anybody that wants to fish it is do not go there any earlier than August. Okay, there's like a three-month window that you have to fish there, August, September, and October. If you go any earlier, you will get eaten alive by mosquitoes. Yep. Okay, and I'm not, I am not exaggerating. It is like plague-like mm. <laughs> conditions. Of, you cannot, you can't eat. You have to like, you know, uh, if you make your dinner, you have to like run into your truck or, you know, go into your tent or whatever to eat. It, it just, you can't sit still. They just like glom onto you. It's, it's yep. insane. So I would not recommend going there. And the fishing can be good, you know, in July, but the mosquitoes are just so bad that it's, it's not hmm. worth going. But it's really weird. In August, it's like somebody flipped a switch and they're gone. It's like they're miraculous. It's just they're completely gone. It's just it's insane. It's weird. Mm-hmm. And that's the time to go because that's when the grasshoppers start to come off. And if you fish a grasshopper pattern there, you can light them up. No kidding. And these fit. You know, the river, and as you, you've been this, you know, I mean, it's like, I don't know, maybe a couple of feet deep in yeah. most places. It's maybe like, I don't know, 15, 20 feet across. It's it's, it's like this dingy little thing, and you think, yeah, you think there's no fish in here, and it's like gin clear. You can see the bottom, you know, it's, and you think there's no fish in here, and you throw your fly out there, and like an 18-inch fish will come up and smash it. <laughs> then you realize, boy, there, there, there are some fish in here. Yeah. <laughs> So yeah, and it's just the, the setting is it's yeah. in a canyon, like you say. It's just it's an amazing, amazing setting. Yeah, uh, and you know this may change too, but I, there's nobody there. Yeah. Every time I go there, you know I, I'm alone. I you know I can walk for five miles and not see another person. Yeah, and again that might change, and that's fine. You know as long as people are respectful. But yeah, so it's it just to me that is the 
if I were to create a fishery, you know, if, if you gave me the the tool or not tools, the, the ability to create my own fishery, I would use that place as a model. Okay, so if you place, it, so somebody's listening to this, they they grab their uh, you know nine foot uh, you know five weight your, your normal trout stuff, throw in some right. some grasshoppers, head over there in August, and uh, and you think they might have a good chance to to find some fish. I think they would have a spectacular chance, an amazing chance. Well, well September's fly? even better. What, what's the fly? I have a fly. Okay. Yeah. I, there's a fly that I made, and it's actually it's in my book. It's called the I call it the Blitzen Hopper. I made this fly specifically for the Blitzen River. And this is in and, this is in the Fly Fisher's Guide book. Correct. Yeah. There's 16 fly patterns in the book as well. You know, in addition to you know the information, I, you know, I there's 16 patterns that I I don't say created but made that I use, and those are all detailed in the book as oh, well. Oh, cool. And these are like your 16 for, if you had to pick 16 for Oregon, these are the patterns. Yeah, more or less. Yeah, these are the ones that I use. Yeah, I use, like, you know, religiously. Um, and I also talk about this in the book, where people carry thousands, you know, literally hundreds of thousands of flies and different patterns. You really don't need to do that. I think you need to keep it simple. And, yeah. you know, if, if you know, if you, yeah, and that's what I try to do here, you know, yeah. and, um, but anyway, this fly, it, one thing you were talking about, um, recommending materials to people or ways to use materials. One thing that I did in this, and I don't know if it's never been done or, you know, it probably has, but one thing I like to do when you're using a wing, making an elk hair wing, is to add crystal flash underneath the wing mm-hmm. to give it extra, it, a couple of reasons. Number one is for the flash. You get the extra flash off of that when the light hits it, but also it gives you some more buoyancy too. All oh, right. So it works as, yeah, so it, it works as like a tandem thing, but mainly it's the flash. Yep. And just put a little, you know, little crystal flash underneath your, you know, elk hair wing. You know, it's killer. Yep. And that's what the Blitz and Hopper has. Okay. All right. Do you, do you have another, you know, if we stay on the, the Donner and Blitz and if, if you had to pick two flies, is there another one you would, you would say that you'd tell somebody, somebody to use? Uh, no, okay. So if you're not fishing a dry, no, I would say 90% of the time you can fish a dry there effectively. Maybe even more, more than and, that. And is it know, always... But, are you always fishing terrestrials? No, no. Uh, the, well, the time of year I go, yes. You know, to answer your question, the time of year I go, yes. But if you were to go earlier, you might, you could probably, you know, using mayfly patterns or caddis patterns. Like I've used a stimulator there and have done well with that too. Yeah. You know, so, but no, for, uh, you can use a nymph. I really don't like using nymphs. I mean, I, you know, I'd rather, I think most people would rather use a dry fly and I'm in that, same ill, but if you were to use a nymph, I would zug bug works really well there. Okay. Okay. But okay. again, I would recommend using a fish on top. I mean, the place is so diminutive that you really don't need to nymph. I mean, you know, you, yeah. you just, you take that hopper pattern, you throw it up against the bank, you throw it up against a rock, like a big boulder or something like that. And just hold on. Damn. This so is... I, really? When I first went there, I, I, I didn't think there were any fish in that. Re- I mean, I, this was 25 years ago, but I, I thought, boy, there's nothing in here. And I just threw my fly on, bam. Wow. I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> and that's when I was sold, you know. Yeah. And then not just that, like I say, just the environment. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, I can, a, can I tell you something? Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll tell you something crazy, in fact, okay? I love that place so much that when I die, I want to have my ashes scattered there. There you go. Okay. <laughs> there you go. That is how much... That is the affinity I have for that river. That's you know, so. That's cool. Well, I, when I think, so I'm going to have a bunch of yeah, a bunch of people are going to flock out there now. But I, that's fine as long as they you know respect yep. the river, you know, and, yeah. and, and enjoy it and appreciate it. That's, that's there, what it's there's there definitely for. somebody that's listening to this right now that's thinking, you know, they've probably already Googled up, uh, you know, the daughter of Blitz and they're they're planning the trip because I mean, just the way you talk about it. You know, I mean, who, who doesn't want to go somewhere where you could throw on a grasshopper and have a, a, a nice big fish come up? Because that's, you know, oh, yeah. that, that's not like always easy. 20 inch fish, you know, that will take a, you know, fly off the top and yeah, <laughs> you'll be fish, fighting that fish for 15, 20 minutes. And, you know, they're, yeah, it's, that's awesome. It's, it's, crazy well, yeah. what is what is is there another so you have your resource obviously if somebody was going there they could pick up right. your book they can find out maybe stay in french glen at the at the little hotel or, or the campground or hit uh um, oh, yeah, page springs the page, great campground oh yeah great. page Springs. yeah i forgot about that yeah page, yeah, yeah, page springs, yeah. springs and uh but is there another book magazine resource or some other thing out there that that would uh help them uh you know get some information on that river or, or what you do there on, a, on that one specific. Well, it doesn't have to be that specific, but just maybe uh, anything come to mind as far as a general resource, maybe about, uh, you know, dry flies, fly, you know, anything just comes to mind generally. 
boy, you know, that's, I, you know, I, I can't really think of anything offhand. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, do you have a, I'm thinking about the magazine. Do you, uh, Northwest Fly Fishing, right. is there, was, has that been highlighted in there? No, it hadn't, right? It might have been a long time ago. Yeah. Um, you know, it has it hasn't been. Re- and I, I will propose the idea now that now that I've mentioned this, and he'll probably hear it. <laughs> yeah. I will. Pro- I'll, I'll talk to John, and I'll propose the idea again because I really think it's you know worthwhile. And I, I'm sure he has his reasons. He has good reasons, and maybe because people have wrote in and told him not to to talk about it. You know, I don't know. Yeah. You know, but uh, again, like I say, if if, if it's a public place, yeah, it's for all of us, you know. So, yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah, and that's how I think it should be. What is so? So you do a little bit of flight tying, right? Do you, do you want to? Uh, oh yeah. Maybe try. I've got a whole list of people in the Facebook group um, uh, that we have. With uh, I always ask some questions to them, like you know, what is your big struggle with flight tying? Do you want to try to answer a few of their questions right now? Yeah. Oh, I, I, I could try. Sure, give it okay. a shot. <laughs> I'm not sure. Shot. I'm not give sure. It a shot. Yeah, if if it, if you can't, we'll, we'll just we will, we'll just uh, pick a couple. And if you can't, no big deal because some of these I look at them and I think, you know what? I'm not an expert. For example, you know, somebody, you know, say one of their big struggle is spinning deer hair, and and I actually next week. Well, let's see. When is it? Yeah, I guess it's uh, uh, Pat Cohen, who's a big uh, deer deer hair guy on the fly tying he he talked about okay. some tips on doing that so i do have some resources but we're, we're actually in a fly tying season now this is season four and although i you know kind of expand out and and hit other topics i i am trying to focus on fly tying so this will be good so let okay. me just let me just let me see if i can take a look at some of these and and when i read down i mean here's some of the questions i'll just read some of these you know like here's a good one i'm getting old in my handshake um but it doesn't slow me down. So, you know, again, so you get older, you got the, you know, the, you got that struggle, you got overcrowding the eye, right, is something we've talked about. Right. Um, uh, I just started tying flies, so trying to learn um, more difficult patterns is, is one of their struggle. Tying sizes 20s and smaller with old eyes, the the whip finish. Yeah, and your hands. And your hands. Too. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. Finding yeah. good, finding good materials, marrying wings. You know, a lot of these questions, when I read them, I'm like, Crap, I don't have a good because I'm not a I'm not I've tied a lot of commercial I've tied flies, but I'm not I wouldn't consider myself a pro dry fly fisherman. I mean, what would you say if you had a general do you have a, a couple of general tips and do you tie more dry flies or or nymphs? Well, I'd say it's probably even, okay. you know, because you yeah, I I want to have both, you know, okay. because you never know what you need. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it's even I I, I prefer using a dry, but like I'll tell you, I would say 75% of the time you're using a nymph. Okay. Oh, yeah, you so you are you using them. Yeah, so, yeah. I, even though I love fishing, you know, if I'm not going to catch anything, I'm not I'll, I'll switch techniques. I'm not going to, you know, beat the water, you know, for nothing. So Yeah. Yeah, if they're not taking anything on top, or we'll go to a nymph, you know, and I actually I normally I'll start with a nymph unless I see something going on. So, yeah. you know, so it is yeah, the nymph fishing is un- I don't want to say unfortunately. I enjoy fishing a nymph too, but there's just so much more enjoyment in fishing a dry fly, in my opinion. Right. What do you, you think know? is the biggest? Yeah. Uh, you know, when you're fishing the nymph, the biggest struggle on tying good, you know, good flies is. Do you think or, or nymphs? Are there any challenges for you or anything that you've overcome? Uh, with nymph fishing, uh, or, or nymph just nymph, nymph, just tying nymphs. I mean, what what are your? You know, I guess you could look at your sixteen patterns. What are those top? Right. What are, what are those nymphs? Well, I like using a zug bug. I mean, to me, a zug bug, and it, you know, it's not my pattern, but you know, actually, a guy named Clifford Zug invented it. I guess when I looked it up. Uh huh. But um, <clears throat> that pattern, to me, is like the best all-around nymph pattern. It has every feature that you, you know, a fish could look for, basically. I think, and I've had a lot of success with it. Mm-hmm. So do you, you, know, do you weight it? Yeah. So or it's or like putting beads on or anything. It's a bead. Yeah, I use a bead. It's a bead head zug bug. Yeah, yeah. I put a little brass bead. Yeah. Yep. And then just you tie it the exact same way as it, you know, it was meant to with a wing pad and, you know, all the other stuff. And yeah. Yeah. It just, the features of that fly, it just, you know, yep. it looks buggy. It just looks, it's, Yeah. You know, it's got the peacock, um, which is. Uh, oh yeah. Amazing. Like my flash. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that, that would be the, the go-to nymph that I, yep. you know. Do you tie any, uh, fact, do, you, do you get into any, um, um, Euro, Euro nymphs or any of that stuff? No, I, you know, I just started reading about that. You know, I wasn't even sure what that was or yeah. what it meant, and I saw a story, and I, yeah, it's like what euro nymphing? What, what, what the hell? <laughs> so, <laughs> well, well, the, the cool thing about euro nymphing is that it's a, uh, it's just like you're saying. You know, you don't 
it, most of those flies don't even imitate anything. You know what I mean? They're just, You're right. they're almost a tractor. So it's this kind of a crazy change from the old, like trying to do your entomology and stuff. You're right. You're right. Yeah. And that's how I was brought up to do this, you know, and that's how I want to continue to do it. You know, that's part of it. Yeah. I think, you know, the entomology part. Yeah, I agree. So I agree. Well, it's like the Tim Kara now yeah. too, that's becoming popular. I'm Japanese. I'm half Japanese. Oh, no so kidding. That's something that I should look, yeah. That's something I should look into, I guess. I, I may someday when I have more time, but, um, Oh, not having a reel, you know, it's having like a, a stick with a string on it. It just seems kind of, <laughs> yeah. I guess maybe that's how it was, in, you know, way back. And maybe the Japanese perfected this technique or something. But right. um, well, I like having a, I like having a reel, you know. Yeah, I know. Me too. I think <laughs> I, I've interviewed, uh, I've got one Tenkara episode and, and I've actually had a number of Euro nymphing episodes with some of the, some of the great Euro nymphers, you know, in the world. And, you know, I think sure. that the take is, is that, the Tenkara, I think, is even more interesting because oh, know, yeah. it's a good – what I think it is is I think it's a good intro. You know, I think you can start out with a reel and stuff, but if somebody's never fly fished before, to just give them a, a, a Tenkara rod, it just takes everything out of it. All they got to do is they got the rod, they go – and the great thing is, is it's really effective catching fish, especially in small cre- uh, spring creeks and stuff. Yeah, right. So, right, if you're in the right environment, yeah, yeah. right habitat. Yeah, so I, so so I, I think, think it is a good – I think it is a good intro uh, sort of thing. And in fact, even Patagonia, you know, the, the company Patagonia, they they had their own line of t- uh, Tenkara. I'm not sure if they still do, but um, – so no, I, I, I'm, it's cool. I think that's what's great about fly fishing. What I love about this show is that I'm digging into some of these things. Just like you, I didn't know much about Euro nymphing or Tenkara, but I think it's – you know, for some people, I think it's a valid way to go. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. If yeah, and maybe you're right. If somebody wants to, you know, get introduced to the uh, to the sport, that might be a great way to introduce them to it. Yeah, you know. But again, to me though, I, you know, I, having a like a Fluger medalist reel, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah, with, you know, that, that's the you know, <clears throat> that's how I was introduced to it. And I think to me, that's how most people or people should be introduced to it. Is just have a even a fiberglass rod, have a yep. Fluger medalist reel, you know, and go yep. out with a floating line and and light them up. <laughs> yeah, I agree. I agree. Cool. All right. Well, we're just about out of here. I just wanted to check in a, a couple more fi- things before we get going. Um, do you have, Certainly. you know, your background in the photography, do you have a, you know, a piece of work that you're most proud of in your life that you can kind of note? Boy, is, that a, is, that, uh, is that a tough question? Well, I've won contests and things like that. I, you know, I, I can't, you know, um, it's hard to isolate your, you know, to get down to your best picture. I mean, you know, yeah. I, I could, well, there is one, all right, yeah. well, I was a news photographer, so, um, and I don't know if you remember this, I'm old you are, but in 1985, there was a plane crash in Dallas, uh-huh. and, and it, like, set off this wave of plane crashes, it was, like, when wind shear was discovered, the Delta, I don't know if you remember, it was in September 85, uh, yeah, the Delta well, plane yeah, I was, crashed in Dallas, I was 10. Dallas, Fort Worth. I was 10, I kind of remember, I think there was a plane crash out here when I was a kid as well. Okay, well, this one in Dallas was... I don't want to say special, but it was significant because, like I say, it was when they dis- discovered wind shear. The, the um, you know, the wind shear existed. They were thinking it was a myth, and like it caused this plane to crash. Well, anyway, I got a, a picture of this. Pl- I got a really great picture of this, the wreckage of the plane. Oh wow! With the identical plane that it was flying above it. So, like, you had the wreckage oh, wow. in the foreground, and then above the, that wreckage was. The, because back then, they didn't close the airport. I was living in Houston, and I this was in Dallas, and I flew from Houston to Dallas to cover this. And they didn't close the airport. We flew right over. You could see the wreckage. No that kidding. Was landing. That is scary. Yeah, and I thought, this is insane. And Jeez. this was at night. This was at night, too. So, you know, it was, they had, like, Fire. lights on it. And we couldn't shoot anything because it was too dark. So we had to sleep on the runway. So I basically slept on the runway, waited for the sun to come up. And when it did, that's when we got our pictures. Holy and this picture was, yeah. It's on my blog. If you oh yeah, I was gonna say where, where blog, can we find, yeah, where could we find that? Okay, I have a. I can the easiest way to, if you if you Google news photography exposed, that's the if you just say that or Gary Weber news photography or something like that, you'll find it because it's kind of a long. You know, the address is very long. I can read it off to you if you like, but I think it, it's way too long. But yeah. if you just look up news photography exposed, you know, at blogspot.com, you should find it. Okay. All right. And. Uh, and, then, and th- you're going to have to search. I've been, I, I was doing that blog for, I don't know, 10 years. It's a l- long time. So, and then there's NBA pictures. If, if you're a basketball fan, yeah. there's a bunch of basketball pictures okay. on there, but you're going to have to search for them. I, you know, I, 
yeah. updated it a lot when I was teaching this class, so the stuff's buried. But that plane picture, if you I think there's a search thing. If you put in there Dallas or plane crash or something like that, it might take you to it. Okay. If you're interested in seeing it. But, yeah, yeah. And NBA as well. Yeah, and NBA stuff. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I see. Oh, nice. Okay, yeah, I got it. Oh, uh, the, the first stuff, like the beginning, if you if you look at it now, the most recent stuff, I was working for ODOT as a photographer, and there's a lot of that on there and things like with fishing. There's some fishing things on there, too, but oh, yeah. if you get deeper into it, go back further. You know, then is there a the search black function? And white. There is, up on the top right. There's there's a yeah, search. there should be a little search. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll, 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 yeah, I'll put a, well, I'll get a link to that because I'm kind of interested to see. Uh, yeah. This would be. Yeah, a, if you're a basketball fan, go yeah. There's one story, um, center, it's called Centers of Attention. It's about centers in the league, like David Robinson, Akeem Olajuwon. Oh, yeah. And it's pictures of them. So if you just put in that search thing, Centers of Attention, you'll okay. get, it'll take you to that story. And it, that'll yeah, there's pictures of. Oh, cool. And what was the, what was the really quickly the, the wind shear? What, what's that all about? Okay. Uh, what, what, what is it? Yeah, yeah. What, what is that? Or, How did they not know about that? And then well, I don't know just, if I can. Okay. okay. All right. Well, I guess. It, it's like a downdraft. It, it, it forces the plane to stall, basically. No matter how what size it is, or what, you know what altitude, or whatever. Okay. It's like some sort of weird, you know, wind uh, meteorological phenomenon. Okay. Yeah. And uh, at the, it, it, I explained it in the blog, you know, uh, in that story. But uh, at the time, they were saying, "No, this does not happen. This is not oh, right. something that's." And then when this plane crashed, they're like, "Oh, oh, geez. I guess you're right. It does happen." Yeah. You know, so. That's when they started putting all these uh, warning systems in the planes and things like that. So that was it was signif- that, that was story huge. was significant. Yeah, because it started all this. Who'd you write that for? Stuff. Or what was that? I was working for a, I was working for an a, a agency called Agence France Press. Oh yeah, the French press agency. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh okay. AFP photo. Yeah, I saw I that. I was doing a little research on on your background. I saw that in there somewhere. Oh okay. Yeah. They when UPI folded, they tried to become the press or the you the know AP. the next. Yeah, exactly, and yeah. they they're still in existence, but they they don't have the you know the manpower yeah. or the gotcha. funds to. Well, you know, what was that like them. when that plane? So was was this like people died and stuff on that plane? That or was this just a what did that? What was that all? I mean, I, what, it was a it was a pretty horrific. Well, if, if you remember when the thing was coming in, it was coming into land and it it lost control, and it like there was a cars. There's like a street, you know. Uh, fronts the airport and it like hit a car, ripped the roof off of this car, you know, and then proceeded to like boom, but you know, just smash like four or five times on boom, boom, boom on the runway and just break into pieces. So just like chunks like scattered all around the runway. Gotcha. So people survived. No, I think everybody died. Oh wow! So so you and were I, there, and I guess that's detailed in there. Too. Again, this is thirty years ago, so I don't remember that, that's one of those things detail, where but. I mean, still to this day, I I don't like flying. I mean, I kind of like it because it's kind of fun to go up. But man, I mean, sure. I don't. I could see how people could you know not fly because every time that plane does the shake or you know you, you're just sitting there like, right. damn, we're up here in this freaking plane, and uh, and you're helpless, and you're helpless, right? You got this guy out. Yeah. There. Well, here's what happened. Check this out. I'm at that Denver. I was in Denver, right? So we're we're taking off. And we're we're going up to whatever mileage they get up to, right? We're probably you know halfway to get getting ready to take off, and the whole plane yeah, yeah. swerves on the tarmac as we're getting ready just to lift off. And I start looking around, okay. at people around me, and everybody's looking like, "What the hell was that? Like, did the guy on. just take his hand off the wheel?" And no announcement. No, nothing, nothing. Yeah. And it was like, oh, okay. it was okay. like everybody was like, "Holy shit, that's our takeoff, and we're not even in the air yet." So you, <laughs> you know, you're constantly thinking, "Holy shit, is this guy?" on something what the hell yeah, so you don't, you anyways we have a yeah. we have a typical flight i think there was some but after we got off when i was walking off the plane i stopped by and i asked the pilot i said i said hey man what 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 was that at the start you know that, that thing that was that, yeah. was that was kind of freaky and you know what he said he was Did like you answer? no he, he just said you know what we just got hit by a big wind gust oh okay that's all it was it was a wind yeah, gust. It, yeah you know okay. what i mean yeah that, 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 that. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me. No, and, and, and you know, and to <clears throat> follow up on what you said, I don't like flying. I used to fly a lot. I I refuse to fly now. Oh no, you know, kidding! You don't refuse, fly. But, no, I don't want to. I'll drive. And why um, is that? Is know, that and, what, why is that? Okay, there's two. There's two reasons. One, because of all the I covered like five or six plane crashes. Number one. Uh, number two, I actually uh, took lessons to learn how to be a pilot. I you know I uh, you know went up and you know I did the lessons and I thought yeah. I thought I wanted to. Actually, what I was thinking of doing, this was the brainstorm I had at the time, was to make like a shuttle service for fly fisher. 
fly fishers. I was going to like shuttle yep. them to Man Lake. Perfect. You know, with with a, a small plane. It, that was my brain. It never would have worked, but <laughs> it, it got me to learn how to fly. But anyway, when I was up the first time I soloed, I almost died. So I thought after that, <laughs> I'm not going to. And the reason I did almost did is because I was coming into land. When, when you solo for the first time, all you do is you make loops around the airport. Yeah. Like you make three loops, you just touch down and you go up again, you make another loop. And Okay, on my third loop as I'm coming into land and be done, this guy pulled out onto the runway and he didn't have a radio in his plane. And I'm trying to tell him I'm ready to land. I, and he, I, I thought I was going to crash into him, basically. Wow. So I put the, you know, I had the plane going as slow. They say low and slow are the two things you don't want to be. And that's what I was. I had oh. the thing as slow as I could, hoping this idiot would take off. Because I'm screaming into my radio, and he didn't have a radio, and so he didn't know. And finally, he did. He took off like at the last minute. I, I didn't want to go around him. I didn't know if he was going to go left or right. Sure. I, you know, I'd smash him. But yeah, so I was like freaking out. I Really, yeah. I thought I was going to die. Yep. And so once I got down, my instructor ripped this guy a new one, yep. <laughs> number one. And then after that, I said, look, man, I don't think I want to do this anymore. I mean, somebody's trying to tell me something. Yeah. It's... <laughs> yeah, so. Gotcha. And the other thing I didn't tell you is when I took off, I didn't have the seat fastened. And so, as you know, as you're taking off, you're like at a 45 degree angle. You're going like straight up. Oh, yeah. The seat slid all the way back. Oh. <laughs> I'm like, oh, shit. Jeez. So I had to grab the dashboard with my, you know, I grabbed the dashboard <laughs> and pull the seat back up and engage it. Wow. But that was the beginning. I know, yeah. So, all these things happened on my first solo flight. I thought, okay, somebody's telling me something. This yep. is, uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, I want to li- live. Gotcha. Yeah. So, so now with the, the planes, you're just still kind of, you got that, that where you, ha- it's a, you kind of have that fear of the plane going down. It's not so much that. You know, I think it's more that you don't have any control over it. Yeah. You know, it's like if you're in a jet, you know, if I'm in a small plane and if the guy had a heart attack, I know how to fly it. I could land. Yeah. It, I think, as long as nobody got in my way, you know. But like in a jet, you're helpless. You, Something yeah. happens. You're you don't you're, think you're you a could... fate's out of your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And like when you're dro- my pickup truck's got three hundred seventy thousand miles on it. Oh, wow. I love to drive. What kind of truck? I have a Nissan a Nissan Frontier. If anybody That's anybody amazing. wants to get a reliable, twenty years old, three hundred seventy thousand mile. Wow. I plan on keeping it to four hundred. Or more. I'm gonna keep it as long as I possibly can. That's that's really. So cool. I've done a lot of driving too as a photographer. I sure. drove a lot too, and I pref- I prefer to drive. You know. So. Yep. Yep. Cool. All right, Gary. Well, I think uh, I think that is about it. We could, uh, you know, obviously oh, okay, this right. is this is a lot of fun. I mean, I think uh, you've got a lot. Yeah, of I could st- talk with you for hours. Yeah, you got a lot of good. <laughs> you got a lot of good stories. What? Um, you know, I, I guess uh, maybe just leave us a, a couple of things here. You know, I don't know if you have. You've told okay. some some good stories, but over the years and covering all the other, is there another story that sticks out? Something that you were involved with that that kind of, you know, is something that you know maybe would surprise some of us or anything over the years. A news story, yeah. A, a news. Oh, okay. Yeah, and again, this is from that era. I would say the space shuttle, the uh, Challenger explosion. Oh, that really right. was. That I was covered that. That was in the eighty six. Eighty six. Yeah. It was in 1986, yep. And um, I was, it, it, you know, it happened in Florida. It was with a teacher, the teacher in space. Yeah, it was that and teacher, teacher in, in yeah, Oregon, I think, mission. from Oregon. Uh, no, I think she was from uh, New Hampshire, oh, okay. actually. Oh, right. <laughs> That's a correction. Yeah, no, it's good. But yeah, it, it, I covered it, so I know. Yeah, Krista yeah. McAuliffe was the woman's name. Okay. You know? And she was from Concord, New Hampshire. But anyway, I was in Houston, and, the, the, you know, the, it happened in Florida, but Mission Control was in Houston, and the place was a madhouse. And then the next day, President Reagan came, and they had like that ceremony oh, you know, yeah. for them and all that. Not it wasn't the next day; it was a couple of days later or whatever. But yeah, yeah. So that was a pretty that was crazy. Yeah, that was yeah. There was a lot going on there. And the other thing too, I would I covered the World Series like three times. Oh, wow. I really enjoyed. Yeah, I enjoyed eighty two. Uh, I was in Milwaukee at the time. Like I got to cover the Brewers Did Cardinals. I was twenty one. No, I won seven games. The Brewers lost in the last. Oh. <laughs> It was a great series. It was like yeah. one of people say it's one of the best series ever. Who who is the was Brewers? Like, who is their big uh, uh, all star? Well, Raleigh Fingers. Oh, Raleigh uh, Robin Fingers. Yount. Robin Yount. Yeah, Robin Yount right. with a mustache. Robin, oh, yeah. Yeah, Robin Yount. Um, Paul Molitor. Paul Molitor. Yeah. yeah. They had Don Sutton back then. He oh was yeah. Pitching. This was in '82. Sure. So, you know, it's ways back. But, yeah. 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 They what had was, quite a team. That's awesome. Who who are the other? What were the other two World Series you covered? Uh, in 87, and then the other one, 89, and that was the other one I was going to bring up, besides the Challenger thing, was the 
San Francisco earthquake. earthquake. I was on the field w- when the earthquake occurred. Oh wow! What was that 89. like? Eighty nine. It was crazy. You know, it's funny. Like the field, it, like it was like waves. Like the field kind of rolled. It was like you're like on a wave, and then it stopped, and the place got and people were high five after that happened. Like it shook. And people started high fiving. They thought it was kind of like a joke. Oh yeah, this is you know this is fun or whatever. Oh, really? And then on the radio, like the Bay Bridge just collapsed. This Jeez. you know the marina's on fire. Oh, and then people are like oh, oh this is not fun. This, no, this is not a good thing. And right. it took like four hours to get out of the stadium. I was up for like two days straight just shooting you know pictures of the wreckage. Wow. Um, yeah. So that was a pretty pretty traumatic. Yeah. yeah. Luckily, my sister she lives in San Francisco and she was okay. Thank, yep. thank God. But I got to spend a lot of time with them during yeah. that. Um, That's crazy. Yeah. Too, so so, that nice. Sounds like yeah. you had a you've had a pretty amazing life. I mean, the jobs you've had, being able to cover some of these some of the biggest stories in the country. That that sounds like you. You've, oh yeah, I've yeah. been yeah, I've been very I've been very fortunate. Yeah, and it's all thanks to photography. That's why I love photography. And again, that takes us back to the phone business. That's why I can't yeah. your phone is not a camera. I know. Yeah, and and that's why I'm so adamant about these things because yeah, I mean, this was my life and yeah. it, and you know, I mean, young people, they aren't even aware. I, I, I guess people are buying film now. I guess it's getting popular with oh, millennials. No they want to, yeah, they think it's like this fad or oh, let's try film, yep. you know, or let's get a, ca- re- a real camera and yep. so it's getting popular again. But I don't yeah. think they understand what, you know, what no. photography is. They never were in a dark room. No. We used to have to make set up dark rooms and bathrooms of hotels, you know, to transmit our pictures. They don't understand stuff like that. No, no, that's the, that's a shame. Yeah, yeah, it's really a shame. Yeah, you know. Yeah, so. no, it is. I, I, I think it's. Uh, yeah, it's like a lot of things. The kids are, uh, you know, they're they're missing stuff. Uh, I don't know what. There's probably some good oh, yeah. good stuff that they're that they're going through now. That you know, maybe they'll they'll right they'll look back at thirty years and be like, well, those and, kids, yeah, yeah. They'll, right. They'll say the same thing that we're saying now. Yeah. I, I suppose, but <laughs> maybe. Yeah, I'm just glad I grew up when I did. That's all. I'm glad I'm old, and I'm glad I grew yeah. up when I did at the era that I did. Exactly. There are no Gary. newspapers now. Uh, in the next uh, in the next six to twelve months, anything new you got coming with yourself, or you know the fly fishing, or anything you want to note here? Well, the last, I just want to say they can uh, if people are interested, they can look for the next book, and it should be out. Uh, it's well, the deadline is in October. It's supposed to be out next spring. Oh wow! Uh, spring of spring of twenty twenty, and it's the uh, Fly Fisher's Guide to Oregon's Mountain Lakes. Yep. So if you have any desire to explore the mountain lakes, this would be your reference to use. Perfect. perfect. I'm going to be doing that. Yeah, myself a lot. Yeah, no kidding. We'll, we'll probably uh, maybe see you out there. And then, uh, yeah, that's a cool thing. That's kind of connects with the you know, the back country. And I, I had an interview or, or I had an interview on with somebody who has a, a wilderness float tubes, and he does. Uh, you might want to oh, check. You okay. might want to check in with him. He's a he's like a one man show, kind of similar to you. He's kind of retired, but he, he started okay. his own, he started his own company because there weren't. I guess float tubes are kind of hard to find the old old school, and so he created this ultra light oh. float tube. So he's all about teaching people how to go into the back country ultra light and go with their fly fishing. Oh, gear. with a float tube. See, that would be great because <clears throat> what I even recommend is to most people don't even bring waders, you know. And I'm like, you know, at least pack waders because you got to wade out to these lakes. And yeah. you can fish them from the bank, but. Yeah, no, no. This guy's uh, it makes so much sense to yeah. This guy's all about um, um, all about going super light. Um, and let me okay. just um, wilderness. I'm gonna just find it. it's called wilderness. I want to find it just so we could note it here. I'll put a link in the show notes. Um, Great. Uh, but yeah, he talked about uh, he talked about basically this boat is I can't remember how many pounds, but I want to say it's just a few pounds. Okay. And. Uh, and then we talked. We talked about yeah. So here it is. It's uh, Phil Hayes, and it's um, yeah. It's okay. it's uh, where are we at here? Episode uh, yeah. It was called uh, uh, Wilderness Light Float Tubes with Phil Hayes Ultralight. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting. He just uh, I have oh, a link okay. in there, and he talked about his product. And so if you want to check that out, you can go find that. But um, one quick question: yeah. Is it, <clears throat> does he inflate it? Is it inflated yeah. before he goes there? No, he inflate uh, it once he, oh, okay. you can. I think yeah, you can. <clears throat> you can inflate it before and strap it on. He's got a little setup where it will strap right onto your backpack. Okay. Or okay, you can, yeah, that would be convenient. Yep, yep. You can do that, or you can, you know, obviously deflate. But yeah, we talked all a little bit about everything, including a packing list and how to go ultralight because that is the struggle. I mean, I've done lots of backpacking in the lakes, probably some of the lakes you're going to, and man, you throw in, mm-hmm. you know, your flippers, your, you know, maybe even oh, boots. Yeah, you know, I mean, your your pack is it feels like it's a hundred pounds. You know, it's just kind of way. Yeah, over. It, yeah, I know that's right, and that's why I asked that because yeah, that's one of the things I struggle with. You know. Yeah. Um, 
you know, it's what to bring and what not to bring. You know, exactly. And not overburden yourself, you know, in the process. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. You know, so. That's it. So, uh, okay. Well, uh, and if I can make one, yeah, what, one last it. recommendation to the people when we're talking about the mountain lakes, I would say if you have a desire or curiosity to do it, don't wait, do it now because, I'm 58, and I can still do this, but it's like I would have enjoyed it a lot more if I would have done it a lot younger. You know, because yep. now as you're walking the trails, I'm getting gassed, and, you know, I have to stop, and, you know, I'm not in the greatest of shape. I'm not in terrible shape, but still, I would think that, you know, the younger you get started on this, and that's why I recommend I'm saying this book, too, you'll enjoy it a lot more, you know, and... um so I would just say, don't wait. Get out there as soon as you can. Yeah, and and I'll highlight just that again. I had a really uh, conversation back in episode ninety nine with uh, Martin Jorgensen. He's the he's over in Denmark. He's the global fly fisher. Um, and oh, he, okay. Yeah, and he highlighted that same thing. He basically said he's traveled. You know, he's traveled a lot of places, but he he has recently come down with MS, and he can't. He's in oh, a wheel, he's in a wheelchair okay. now, and. Um, oh boy. You know, and he's got a great life, but still, basically, he said that exact same thing you, you just said. He said, don't wait to go on that trip. Go do it now, because you never know. Exactly. I was at the Sky Lakes Wilderness last summer, and I you know, and I love it. I'm going back there. But yeah, I, I was getting gassed. I was like, boy, you idiot. You should have done this when you were in your 20s or 30s. There you go. There <laughs> you go. <laughs> when you're, when you're 60, <laughs> I mean, it's kind of crazy. Yeah. <laughs> but you do what you can, you know. Exactly. Yep, that's it. All right, Gary, well, I'll let you go. Thanks again for coming on and, and sharing right. your resource. I think uh, anybody who's coming to Oregon or in Oregon, they want to you know, find some new places or just get a little extra resource. Your book is a good one. So appreciate you coming on and chatting. And uh, yeah, it was, it's been fun going into all this uh, random stuff today as well. Yeah, yeah. I hope we stayed somewhat on track. And I, you know, thank you. It's been a pleasure. I have enjoyed talking with you. All right, Gary, we'll, we'll keep in touch with you. Talk to you soon. Okay, take care. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes, all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash Weber. That's W-E-B-E-R. Head over to uh, wetflyswing.com slash AK if you want to hear more about the upcoming trip to Alaska. I wanted to say uh, thanks for your support. This is pretty close to the two-year anniversary of uh, the first episode we published in late 2017. I wanted to uh, give a cheers to all the guests we've had so far and, and hope that you've maybe picked up a, a tip or two along the way, maybe even had a laugh. I wanted to uh, say thanks for again for stopping by and checking out the show today. I hope to maybe see you uh, online or on the river. 